Okay, you are now recording. Great. Uh, thanks, Stephanie, and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, this is the February 17th meeting uh, for the Solar Bylaw Working Group, Town of Amherst. Um, thanks again, everybody. Um, thanks, Stephanie, for putting our agenda together. Um, we do, we, yeah, we certainly have a quorum now, so great. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so first order of business is to look at my list here, <clears throat> and um, I believe it's um, Martha. Your time has come if you're available to do the minutes. Oh, oh, okay. It isn't Dan? Oh. Um, Dan, you did it last did it last, time. Uh, last we week. did it last time. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, let's see. All right. <laughs> yep. Sorry. Uh, no. Oh. Okay. I guess I'm. Guess I can do it here. Got my. Am I next then? Yeah, I guess I can alert people ahead of time. So uh, yeah. Jack is. Uh, yeah, Jack's next after. All right, I'm gonna have to get mentally prepared for yeah. that. <laughs> yes, right. I know that helps. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's best for me not to know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, great. Thank you, Martha. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, sorry, just getting my uh, desktop in position here to uh, get the agenda in my in the position I like. Okay. Great. Um, so um, uh, we will see if we can catch up on on minute approvals. Um, because uh, now we do have the minutes from January 6th, uh, as well as the minutes from last meeting, uh, February 3rd. Uh, so uh, they were distributed in the packet. Um, any uh, comments or um, discussion on those minutes? Um, otherwise, I'd like to see if we can move to have those approved. Um, yeah. And let me, before I go on, yeah, we don't have any any presentation or anything like that. So um, uh, we can get through this first. So um, Martha, do you have a comment on the uh, minutes? Yeah, yeah. The, the January 6th minutes, when we had Chris Bascom from the fire department, I have one question. Our Chris, Chris Breastrop, uh, mentioned that the proximity to adjacent forest land allowed is no closer than 10 feet. Is is I that correct? That. Pardon? Is that correct? Just 10 feet? Maybe you can reference where in the minutes you're- Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's you know, at the end of uh, Chris from the fire department's presentation, there were uh, comments from different people. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Chris Brestrup made a comment that uh, the proximity to adjacent forest land allowed was no closer than 10 feet. And I wondered if the ten, that 10 feet was correct. I would have naively thought it was bigger. <laughs> what page is that on? It's on the last page, uh, the second page and last page um, in the set of questions for Captain Bascom. Um, your name is there. <laughs> Taken in vain. <laughs> I don't remember saying that. Um, I can share. I can, I can um, go back to verify it. Dwayne, can I, I, recording. I jump in too? Because I was going to raise a question about that. Yeah, go ahead. So my notes, unfortunately, I, there were two CBs, but um, I remembered that Chris had recommended a hundred foot buffer from the forest. And my notes say, Chris Bascom, 10 feet for combustibles, 10 feet for forest, thinks we need more than 10 feet um, by a large tree or canopy of trees. He wants a 10 foot path around the fence line or outside the fence line. Keep quote keep as far as possible um, something shading keeping under view reasonable distance, and so I think so. Somebody said a hundred feet, and it could have been Chris Bascom or Chris Brestrup. So maybe it's a good time to go back and listen to that because I think that's oh, a really 
big difference. Yeah. Why don't yeah. we just hold these off then and I'll <laughs> okay. go back and watch it again. <laughs> it's okay. okay. Add a complication, okay. but uh, nope, it's no, it's good. Yeah. It's better to be yeah. accurate about who said what. So yeah. I'll make sure. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, and Jack. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I remember the, the prior chief or I forget his title, but I remember him saying that because I thought it was unusually small. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. But yeah, we'll get get it straight, I guess. So. I'll just verify it from the recording, yeah. and then we can just put these off until the next. Uh, once again, <laughs> we'll just put okay. them off till the next okay. meeting. Yeah, because if it really is ten feet, it might be something we want to put down for discussion ten times sometime. Whether we would want to change that in our bylaw. Yeah, there is a reference to 100 feet earlier in the minutes from directly from the captain. Um, they're required to be 100 feet from any other structure or public way. Uh, yeah. Okay. Would that be worth uh, clarifying? And so thanks, Stephanie. Um, so um, is that okay with everybody if we verify that and then and then return to these minutes yet again next meeting? Great. Mm -hmm. uh, any other um, thoughts on uh, on this set of minutes before we turn our attention to last meeting's minutes? Great. Okay. So, any um, thoughts, discussions on the minutes from last meeting, February third? Is when did we get those? I don't have that. They're in your in, packet. They were the all packet. sent. Oh. Yeah. Okay. It's all sent together. All right, check. Well, suffice to say, I haven't read them. <laughs> Sorry. Do you want to take a minute for me to put them on the screen and go through them? I don't think they're that long. Okay, that'd be great if it, people don't mind. Otherwise, I can just take a pass. Uh, just bear with me one second. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Sure. Um, I'm, I've read the first page.
All right, any um, thoughts or comments? Um, yeah. Go ahead. So I would I would like to add um, that to the section when we were discussing the um, questionnaire that I wanted to discuss question seven and eight. And then I found the discussion of question 10 useful. And that was the only question we had really discussed in depth. That's it. Is that something you would um, be fine with Stephanie adding after a vote? Um, yes. Yeah, fine. you just do it as amended. So yeah, yeah, as the amended, vote is to not, for... not do the wordsmithing right now. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it right now. You just yeah. tell me if that's the language we'll put in. I tried to make it as brief as possible. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's concise. <laughs> okay, with that um, amend, amendment um, included, uh, is there a motion to um, accept these minutes? I'll move. Thanks, Shannon. And a second? I'll second <laughs> to move things forward. <laughs> okay, and by voice vote? Um, Jemsek? Uh, approve. Uh, can you give me a yes or no vote? Sorry. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Hanner? Yes. Corcoran? Yes. McGowan? Yes. Breger? Yes. Brooks? Yes. Okay. Minutes are approved. Great. With the. Um... As amended. Thank you to yeah, as amended, and a thank you to Dan for um, putting those minutes together. Great. Okay. Uh, so we'll go through a few of the um, um, routine sort of uh, parts of the agenda, but I did just want to sort of lay out the schedule for the day. We're going to focus mainly um, on our work at hand, which is the uh, bylaw itself, and uh, great appreciation to uh, Chris for. Um, providing an, an, uh, a, a, a new section uh, draft for the uh, bylaw on the uh, submittal requirements. Uh, but we're going to go through uh, sort of the what we'll call sort of the second reading of the monitoring and maintenance, uh, which is not so much a read through again by Chris, uh, but a uh, opportunity to hear um, any thoughts, discussion, suggested edits. Okay. Um, from the uh, reading through that we did in the first read through last last time, uh, get through that, and then we'll do a first reading of the submittal requirement section, um, where Chris can literally read us through uh, to understand um, that language, uh, offer some initial thoughts um, and ideas, uh, and then that will tee us up, and, and then we'll have the the. A period of time to review it in depth ourselves uh, and come back for a second reading on that next next time. Um, great. Uh, and then we do we do um, uh, following that, uh, um, I will take a little time to talk about the ECAC letter um, that was in our packet um, to provide some um, uh, sense of of um, scaling and ideas. Uh, from ECAC with regard to um, how ECAC is looking at this in terms of the um, potential uh, need and, and uh, thinking about uh, how to think about land use uh, need, potential land use needs for solar in Amherst. Um, and then we'll talk about future topics uh, for discussion. Janet had um, um, uh, put forward some ideas that she can uh, go through and then open that up to anybody else as well. Uh, and then we'll um, uh, close out with public com comments and so forth. Um, so does that sound sound good with everyone? Great. Um, let's start then with um, with staff updates um, from Stephanie and, and uh, Chris, if there's anything um, beyond the <laughs> bylaw that we'll jump into later. Okay, thanks, Dwayne. Um, so I we have a probably one of our final um, 
tech meetings after this meeting this afternoon to look at the um, final draft of the solar assessment. It will be presented at your next meeting, which is March 1st. So uh, March 3rd, I'm sorry. So it will be presented to the ECAC on March 1st and to you all on March 3rd. Um, I have booked the uh, Woodbury room for the two community workshops. Um, right now they're scheduled for March, Saturday, March 18th from noon to two. And then on Thursday, March 23rd from 6 to 8 p.m. I just have to ensure that I can confirm that second date with um, Adrian. Uh, the original date that we had proposed wasn't available. Um, so those two are moving forward and then we're going to have a uh, conversation um, about the large sort of introduction information session, um, which will be prior to those two meetings. So it'll probably be either the week, my guess is the week or two before, um, might even be sooner. Um, to have a big community session. So um, originally we had said the community session would be, I think on March 3rd, but we've had to, because we sort of took more time with the survey than we had anticipated, um, it's kind of moved us back a, by a week. However, it doesn't change the the community sessions workshops are, are about when we we said we were we were going to to do them. So we're pretty pretty much on schedule. All right, great. Um, any um, thoughts or questions for Stephanie? Um, yeah. Go ahead, Martha. Uh, yes. The what about then the GZA's uh, actual land survey at one of the ECAC meetings that I listened to in January? Uh, the statement was made that that survey wouldn't be ready until sometime in April. Uh, and yet, Dwayne, on your uh, work plan and our schedule, uh, February and March are indicated as the times we would review that plan. So I wondered, what is the true status? I'm not sure which land survey. I, well, I, think, I think it's the assessment. Yeah, I think I think uh, it's, that's the, what... it's the assessment. So you're yes. going to get it March first. Uh, Mar yeah, March third. Okay. I'm sorry. Right. Third. I keep confusing oh, okay, the two. Okay, so I guess committees. I'm confused between the assessment and the and the survey. Okay, so the solar assessment is just about ready. Yes, it's yeah. Oh, it's oh, okay. So we're so Thank today you. is kind of our final sort of uh, look okay. at at the final draft. Oh, ter terrific! All right. So you'll get it at the next meeting. Yes. Yeah, but the solar survey then we never did see. Of anything final after we'd had the discussion of question 10 and a couple other things last time. Um, I think your at the last meeting, I think it was um, revised based on final comments and there weren't many changes beyond what you all asked for and Adrian said she would do. So I can okay. I can certainly send that to you. Um, you know, just to sort of have in your packet. I'll try I'll I'll include that for next time. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Sure. Good news on the assessment. All right. Good. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, Janet. Um. So. So is I have like three quick questions. One is so the G GZA survey questions are going out in April. Is is that correct? Steph? No. No. The survey questions are going out soon. Um. Um. They were they were meant to be soon after the um big community information session. So that's going to kind of launch getting the survey out and it will be open for a few weeks. Um, so that will be, and then the, you know, the website will be made available. So all of that is going to happen at the very sort of beginning of March. Okay. So it's going to go out after the sessions. So that is kind of April, but maybe a little earlier. No, it's going before it's going in March. It's not going in April. It's going to be closed by April. Well, the sorry, survey, the you... survey itself, the survey, you just asked about the survey questions. Yeah. Okay. The survey questions are going to be um, available in March. And for, because we have two community workshops scheduled, the ones that I just, the dates that I just said, which are um, March 18th and March 23rd. So the survey is going to be available prior to that date. Oh, and okay. there's a website that they have that they're putting up 
that will also have the survey. So people are going to be directed to that. They'll have an opportunity to answer questions during the or the surveys during the workshops. So um, that's all happening in in March. Okay, I thought you said it was going out afterwards. So that was my first question. No. Okay, and then uh, we're we're going to work on the presentation like background materials for the um, community meetings in a subsequent meeting, right? To this, is that what you said? Uh, I don't, I don't believe so. I, I know that Adrian and I will be working on the materials for that. I mean, you all are focused on the bylaw. We're working on the workshop. I think we'll share what we're putting together, but um, that wasn't to be heavily sort of um, directed by this committee for the workshops. That's something that GZA was hired to do. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important issue about how the information the community gets and the framing of it. So I think it'd be great for us to take a look at that um, and, you know, put it in the context of the state um, 2050 plan and our own, you know, climate action plan and information. So I think it'd be great to have that, you know, the framing, I think, will help set the table for what people are going to discuss. So, well, that's exactly what, yeah, that's what we're we're doing. So we'll have a conversation and share that information with you. But we, I mean, we can't wait for your meetings. I mean, we need to be moving this forward. So at this time, you know, we've spent a lot more time on the survey than we anticipated. So, you know, we're just trying to sort of move that along. But we'll share that information with you for sure. Yes, you know, I'd like to second that, that it's very important what background information gets given because that sets the tone for the survey. And so it's very important that, say, all aspects of the state's uh, decarbonization roadmap uh, get presented there and, uh, you know, kind of a balanced picture. So it, I, I would like to really formally request that we get a chance to uh, at least review those materials in advance and, and make comments. There's going to be, so I do want to emphasize that there is a website that the consultant is putting together where all of the materials are going to be made available. I'm already reviewing some of that now. Um, so all of that information is going to be on the website. The community sessions are specifically to engage residents um, in a more sort of interactive process. So we're not going to be necessarily giving a whole bunch of materials to people at that time. It's more to sort of introduce people to what the town is looking at in terms of solar and to get a sense of where people, um, you know, can understand how that relates to the map. So the, so the assessment, that map layer will be made available and it's just to kind of understand um, where that sort of falls. And then there'll be an opportunity, obviously, to um, access the survey. But information will be available for sure. It's just that there's not going to be um, a stack of materials when people enter the room to be going through. I just want to be clear about that. There's, you know, we'll be directing people to the website, and mm -hmm. everything will be there. It's a lot of information, and it's all on the website. Well, I would, I would still like to repeat the request. You say you're going to have this community information session first. And that's, you said that was the time you were going to give out information. And so that's where I think it's important for us to at least know, you know, what's going to be presented and perhaps a chance also then to review the website before it goes public. Don't we have an opportunity to at least see what's there, see if we feel that it's uh, complete or? Um. Well, I can certainly, I mean, depending on the time frame, I'm sure we can make sure that we share that information. We're not trying to hide it. I just, I'm trying to move it along. So yeah. I will, you know, I will um, see to make sure if we can get this out to you and the ECAC, because I think they're interested as well. It's again, I, it's both committees that I'm trying to respond to. So yes, um, but I will share that information. Committee. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so great. Um, uh, Chris, obviously, <clears throat> um, your main update is the, the first and second reading of the sections, but any other um, updates from planning? 
Yeah, I should mention that um, we did receive a uh, an application for the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, and it's going to be a public hearing on, I think it's April 6th, um, and it's for a battery storage facility on Sunderland Road. So people may be interested in um, finding out about that. It's a standalone battery storage system, and it's um, going to be reviewed by the Zoning Board of Appeals. It's already been reviewed by the Conservation Commission. Mm -hmm. But um, each time we go through these things, we um, understand this whole um, process and industry better. And mm -hmm. so um, you may be interested in following that project. Uh -huh. All right. Um, yeah. Great. Again, I want to focus on on our job yeah. here, which is the zoning bylaw. But um, any any uh, quick response to that, Janet? Um, so, Chris, I, I meant to ask this previously. Um, in terms of battery storage, we had talked about, um, or you had talked about hiring a consultant to help draft that part of the solar bylaw. And I know that, I know your situation is beyond dire in terms of um, time and work. Is that still going forward? Or, because, um, you know, part of with the ZBA, I was kind of, when I heard about that at the planning board meeting Wednesday night, I thought, you know, we've been learning a lot about battery storage and looking at some bylaws. And so I thought maybe we should pass that information to the ZBA, but then I, I remembered the consultant. So I wondered. If you so, could... yeah. So Stephanie may be able to talk a little bit more about the consultant, but I, I am not currently planning to incorporate um, anything about battery storage into this current zoning bylaw. We've been um, tasked with the, um, the task of putting together a, a zoning bylaw dealing with large scale uh, ground mounted solar installations. And that does not include standalone battery storage. They're treated differently in state law. The large scale um, ground mounted installations are um, exempt from certain parts of um, zoning, um, but the battery storage is not. The uh, Zoning Board of Appeals has um, every right to review that and deny it if it feels like it's not um, satisfactory. And I feel like we don't know enough about battery storage yet to put together um, as a bylaw about battery storage. So that will come, but I'm not planning to put it into this um, section of the bylaw dealing with large scale ground mounted solar arrays other than uh, anything having to do with the battery storage that goes along with the array. So for standalone battery storage, we're not planning to include that in our solar bylaw at this time. Hmm. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. And recognizing that um, uh, many, if not all of the larger scale ground mounted arrays will have batteries uh, at this point. So um, That's uh, right. um, we'll, ha we'll deal a lot with battery storage in terms of zoning, but in um in uh, context with the ground mounted solar array mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right good uh, martha yes just quickly i was very impressed by uh chris from the fire department who came and talked with us it seems to me he's very knowledgeable you know really has things under control and so on so it seems we don't need a separate consultant and it would seem that he's the one really that to rely on for for any uh, specific things we might need in terms of the bylaw or uh, and so on. And so my question just to Chris is in the process for this application that you have now for a standalone battery, is it just a matter of course that the fire department also reviews it? May I? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, um, we do make a transmittal to all the town departments. We have a long list of departments that we transmit applications to. And um, so we will certainly uh, transmit it to Chris. Um, and we will probably want to have a meeting with him before the um, application goes to the Zoning Board of Appeals just to get his, um, his comments on it uh, directly, rather than just relying on a memo. So Yes. Yeah. Great. Sounds good. And, and and Stephanie. Yeah, just really quick in response to Janet's question and Martha's comment. Um, Chris and I spoke internally, and um, after Chris's presentation, realized that he is in fact the expert, and so it was really kind of unnecessary to do to go beyond um, 
outside of the town for that expertise. So um, that's why we decided not to go with another hiring another consultant. Thanks. Yeah, I impressive and and um, not only was he like really interested in um, in in this topic, but also um, it sounded like he was well engaged with what's going on statewide and nationally on on the topic um, and, and staying up to speed uh, on the, on the issues. Okay, um, great. Something new, Janet? No. Um, our our charge says that we're supposed to do um, battery storage in our bylaw. So that, I'm a little startled by the conversation here, but that's battery storage related to large scale ground mounted um, solar installations. So yeah. that's different from standalone battery storage. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think we're maybe we're talking past each other then. So I, I'm not saying, so I was just wondering if we're going to hire an expert to help us on battery storage bylaw sections that regulate battery storage along with the solar large mounted ground systems. If we need to, we will. We have some money available, but we don't um, know what the questions are yet. So if we need to, we have some money. But right now we feel that we have a pretty good handle on um, the, the battery storage that's associated with uh, large scale ground mounted solar arrays because we have Chris Bascom yeah. as, um, as our local expert. Okay, so we're gonna be drafting some sections based on his knowledge and- mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, sorry, the All right, good. Okay, let's move on to the next agenda item. Uh, um, for, for any um, updates or, or comments from any of the of us who liaise with committees. Um, I'll just mention that uh, I'll have an update from ECAC, but that sort of uh, is will be covered in uh, agenda item five with regard to the letter that we circulated. But any other um, Comments from from any of the other committees. Uh, Jen, is that a new hand or? or oh, sorry, sorry. I'm, okay, I'm sorry. I'm a little okay. No, thank yeah, you. Okay, nothing from planning board. <laughs> All right, good. Okay, seeing nothing, let's move on to the uh, next agenda item and um, uh, sort of why we're all here, <laughs> quite frankly, uh, which is uh, um, drafting the bylaw. Um, and so, um, again, thanks so much, Chris. I, I do know. Um, who said your position, your situation was dire. I'm not sure if that's, if you appreciate that, but um, we recognize the the effort and the um, uh, resource issues that you're working under. So really appreciate um, your um, uh, continued perseverance through through this drafting. Um, and so um, let's, does that sound okay if we sort of go through as a second reading uh, to sort of just see what um, any, uh, uh, what the, the, um, current draft of of the of what we looked at last time looks like, and entertain uh, any discussion on that um, from folks that have looked at it. We don't necessarily need to we don't need to read through it, uh, but to review it uh, to see if there's any uh, comments. Recognizing again that this will not be our final look at this section. We'll look be looking at all sections in in the in their entirety uh, as we get towards the end. Uh, but let's. Um, yeah, and thank you. Um, is that Stephanie sharing screen? Yeah, good. Um, so may I say a couple of things? Yeah, please. Just that um, this document was revised once based on um, a meeting that we had in January, and then it was revised again um, just the other day. And so actually it was not just the other day. Today is the 17th. I think I Anyway, so there are two sections here. One section is um, something that we've been over before, and the other section is um, something that we haven't been over before. So yeah. do you want me to start with the part that we haven't been over before? I think so. You mean the, the most recent ed edits that you did, um, 215, say? Yeah, I mean, I can do those um, the most recent edits based on a previous meeting of this group. Great. Which would be starting with abandonment or decommissioning, and we could just okay. read through those and then yep. read through the rest of this okay. section. So that would be on the bottom of page two. Um, so abandonment or decommissioning, any large-scale ground-mounted solar voltaic installation or any substantial part thereof not used in the production of electricity 
for a period of one continuous year or more without written permission from the permit granting authority, PGA, or is operating at less than 25% of its nameplate capacity, or that has reached the end of its useful life, or has been abandoned consistent with the abandonment section of this bylaw, shall be considered discontinued and shall be removed. I note that um, I don't have the copy that I think it was Bob Brooks edited. And for some reason, um, I don't have that copy here. But he did note that uh, the word abandonment um, in the first paragraph should not be capitalized. So, mm -hmm. but I, I do remember that. Yep. Um, and then there were concerns about whether uh, this would um, make trouble for uh, a battery installation, or excuse me, a solar installation, if it needed to be repaired, or if some unforeseen circumstance came and and you know it had a, a bad accident or um, damage as a result of storm. So I added this section, which was based on our conversation last time. Uh, and this, it says, this section shall not apply to the temporary cessation of operation due to standard and expected repairs or for reconstruction due to unforeseen events such as storms or accidents. And I think, you know, we've talked about storms before, but you can imagine there could also be an accident. Some uh, truck could go by and, you know, damage some of these arrays. So we have to make... Um, you know, room for that to happen. So we're saying here that um, if this thing goes down for a certain amount of time because of repairs or reconstruction, that it won't be counted against this uh, this installation. Does everybody mm -hmm. understand that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. All right, moving yeah, on. Uh, let's just say, oh. let's see what Jack has to say. Yeah, I'm just saying uh, we have like a, a huge rooftop solar so I, I know how solar generation goes and i'm just wondering if it's clear that when we say it's operating at less than 25 percent of its nameplate capacity it counts for you know snow cover uh cloudy days overcast day i mean i there's a lot of days it's it's uh it's less than 25 <laughs> percent but i understand um what you're saying here and i guess over you know over a period over a period of, over i don't know qualify it somehow maybe but a little bit of the word smithing there is might be helpful i think you want to put a period of time in there um well, I guess if we look in the rear room mirror, mirror and, and it's like goes for, you know, for several months, I would think that then we can start taking a look at, you know, taking a look at it. But mm -hmm. I'm I'm not, I don't really have an answer. Maybe Dwayne would have a better idea. Uh, if I'm sorry, I know you can't really see Dwayne. So can I just jump in? Because I have maybe a suggestion. Yeah, please. Definitely. Perhaps you want to say um, operating less than 25% of its nameplate capacity that is not due to cloud cover, snow cover, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. I guess, the, the, uh, you know, technically a solar panel, solar collectors operate at, at what, what is called a capacity factor of, of well under 25%. It's usually about 13, 14% in Massachusetts. Um, uh because it well it's it's nighttime half the time um and it's cloudy a good good amount of the other time uh and so the a average for the state is about 13 or 14 percent so i i think that i mean a lawyer could could read that 25 percent of name plate capacity and be a, a lawyer for the solar developer could be concerned about that to say oh we can never operate um at 25 percent uh of nameplate capacity on a full-time basis um so maybe there is some tweaking of language there of of uh, 25 percent of its um normal uh of its uh of its um well I'd, I'd have to think about the language there but um uh so maybe we can flag that for or some um yeah I guess what I was gonna um I was gonna suggest also just as a 
protocol is maybe that as we go through this and if there are issues that linger and remain and need to be addressed, we kind of just highlight those sections in, in yellow or something mm -hmm. uh, to give us um, give us all the um, recollection and, and, and opportunity to come back um, at, at a later date, be it, you know, Chris, yourself over the mm -hmm. next couple of weeks or us when we go through this as, as a final time as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, I did have another question, Chris, for for you on this on the additional sentence you put in for in red. There is like, do we need to sort of specify who's making that call um, in terms of um, uh, that that um, uh, that there was a sufficient storm um, uh, or 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 accident? Is that would that be the um, permitting granting authority? It would probably be the building commissioner. As determined by the building commissioner. Yeah. Janet, I didn't call on you yet, <laughs> and you're muted. So, <laughs> but now I will. Thank you, and I'm sorry, um, Chris. I think you told us the last time that the each um, installation will be reporting annually on its production. Is, That's is, my understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just. So that might help with the snowy days thing. I don't know. Oh, it could be like uh, operating on, on less than 25% of its norm, of its expected annual uh, generation. Okay, let's move on though. All right, I'm taking notes. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, next paragraph, upon written request from the building commissioner addressed to the contact address provided and maintained by the owner or operator as required above, the owner or operator shall provide evidence to the building commissioner demonstrating continued use of the installation. Failure to provide such evidence within 30 days of such written request shall be conclusive evidence that the installation has been discontinued. So in other words, if the building commissioner um, sees that this uh, facility is not, in his opinion, is not operating, he would reach out to the owner or operator with a letter with written communication and about, you know, are, what's going on here? Are you operating? And if he doesn't hear back from them, then he can um, take that as evidence that the installation has been discontinued. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in the next paragraph, this is something that uh, Laura brought up a question about. Um, the owner or operator or landowner and she was not sure that landowners should be included there, mm -hmm. shall physically remove the installation no more than 150 days after the date of discontinued operations. The owner or operator or landowner shall notify the town clerk, permit granting authority, and the building commissioner by certified mail of the proposed date of discontinued operations and plans for removal. So I don't know what to do about that question. I haven't had time to research whether um, landowners should be included in there or not. But um, so, you know, that, that question is remains open. So maybe that should be colored in yellow. The two words, landowner, landowner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, Jenna has a comment, and then I actually have a mm -hmm. comment as well. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, isn't it the op the owner of the the solar panel or facility or array? They're the ones who are putting up all the performance bonds, right? And the disc. So I think it would, to me, it just makes logical sense. It would be whoever owns the the system. Mm -hmm. But you know, maybe making them both responsible will make sure it gets done. But I could see how you wouldn't if one per if the operator or the owner of the arrays is putting up the performance bond, um, and they kind of cut and run, that might just leave the landowner kind of liable for something they never expected. So I think mm. about you know, I always like to think of the malfeasance scenario, you know, because that's what we always see in court and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So. 
there's probably something, if the landowner is different from the owner or operator, there's probably something in their lease that um, yeah. Yeah. holds the landowner harmless if the owner or operator uh, cuts and runs, as you said. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. But they're probably, the, the landowner might be the least knowledgeable person about what is going on or what could go. So I think we can help protect them. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I guess I just had, I mean, it, this isn't necessarily for you, Chris, but just for discussion. I mean, I'm, I am wondering about the, you know, you know, I'm always thinking about every potential scenario here, but like the scenario where there is something like that really malfunctions with the solar panels themselves and they have, they, they, they're not operating um, uh, sufficiently. And, and there's this trigger that, that um, the array needs to come down um, to be removed. Um, but there may be the situation where, um, you know, the, the, the company or another company might want to come in and put up, um, replace the panels with, with uh, new panels, uh, but keep the, keep the mounting structure. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it'd be a shame to require all the mounting structure to be removed just to put it back up. Um, and so I'm wondering if there can be something here about, um, that the 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 extent and the and the uh, decision about the removal um, be um, uh, reviewed and approved and approved by the town, the building uh, building what is it, commissioner or whoever it would be um, to you know in the circumstance where there's a good case made that we're going to leave the the structure or something else leave the structure um, but take the panels away. That, that that can be accommodated. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will look into that. Great. Okay. Okay. Um, and this is where the second half of this paragraph is where Bob had some language that does not is not reflected here. So um, he may be able to share it with us as we move through this. Removal shall consist of A, physical removal of all large-scale ground-mounted solar voltaic installation structures, equipment, security barriers, and tr transmission lines from the site. B, recycling of all possible materials and removal of all remaining solid and hazardous waste in accordance with local, state, and federal waste disposal regulations. C, stabilization or revegetation of the site as necessary to minimize erosion <clears throat> and prevent impacts to wetlands or water bodies. Uh, the, the permit granting authority may allow the owner or operator to leave landscaping or designated below grade foundations provided they are filled in to minimize erosion and disruption to vegetation. This requirement may be waived if the landowner submits a plan for reuse, uh, reuse of the site. Um, now that's kind of what Dwayne was talking about. So if um, the landowner wanted to, you know, keep the structures and reuse the site, then he could submit a plan to the town, probably to the building commissioner, and maybe it would have to be approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals um, for reuse of the property, saying that he's going to come back in and put new panels in or something like that. Um, D, any site that was deforested for the installation shall be restored to encourage native tree growth, including the planting of seedlings if necessary to establish growth. Now, Bob may be able to tell us what language he wanted to put in here. I don't have a copy of that in front of me, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that. No. Oops. Okay, um, I guess I'm on. Okay, was, one was a question. And it says here they shall restore uh, tree growth, tree veg, or uh, native tree growth. Are, are, is the town does the town have authority to require that, or once the site is cleared and it's zoned for another use, could the owner, or was the owner at that time, opt opt to put in some other use that would take advantage of the open space? That was the question. I don't know. Well, I think we do say something about that a um, couple of sentences along. Uh, after okay. the plan for reforestation, we say 
This requirement oh. may be waived if the landowner submits a plan for reuse of the site. So in other words, okay, if I'm not sure that was to, there when I read No, it, I think you're right. So if if the landowner wants to turn it into a, a field to grow some field crops or something, he would have the opportunity to do that as long as he submits a plan. Mm -hmm. And my it other is just a whoops. So, so comment. shouldn't that go after sec after the uh, maybe also after the um, paragraph D? Oh. Oh. It is sort of after paragraph D, right? Yes. <laughs> That's that's part of paragraph D. Okay. But I understand. I'll try to clarify that, and make it clearer. Okay. And then I had a note to myself to check with the wetlands administrator, Aaron Jock, regarding uh, di uh, diameter at breast height, DBH, and species requirement for plant replacement because she has something about that in the uh, wetlands bylaw. But then um, Bob brought up the uh language about um a forest i uh, forget what you called it okay uh, what did yeah. you call that okay so especially if later on we're always requiring certified license whatever and here uh foresters are licensed in massachusetts so if we're going to rehab we are going to require a plan i just was suggesting that it be prepared by a licensed consulting forester prepared by Licensed consulting consulting forester. All right, that's good. Thank you. Okay, did anyone have any other comments about that? Um, Janet, you're muted. So, um, I think we should think about all the different large scale solar arrays that might be removed it could be on a you know if, if we're if we're regulating um any array that's one acre or more of panels that could be over a parking lot or you know a brown fields or you know some you know abandoned thing in north amherst um and so i i wondered if and this um so i'm wondering is this ties into um our next section um, are we, is there going to be a requirement of a removable removal plan um, or a restoration plan in the submittal requirements? Are we going to require that? Because then we can just say, you know, you know, you know, maybe we need a section about removal plans. <laughs> you know, like you need to submit a plan for how this ends and whether it gets restored to its prior condition, and mm -hmm. so that that might help make this smaller, maybe. Um, so I think we should think about the variety of large arrays that might just, and then if I'm just wondering if there, there's a removal and restoration management a plan, we're going to require somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, site res restoration is, you know, obviously a very broad term that would be different in different spots. And I don't know if we would specify, like, in this kind of land, we need to see it look like this. If it's a parking lot, you probably just don't want to leave it with a bunch of um, panels sitting there or sticks in the air kind of thing. Um, the other thing I just thought is this this paragraph itself is getting really dense. And so maybe like some bullets or um, kind of indentations and stuff like that, it'd be easier to understand. Mm -hmm. You know, so, yep. so that's kind of like, how does the leg bone connect to the ankle bone kind of question? Like, yeah. All right. Good, good ideas. Okay. Um, and then we're getting on to, okay, so our, our review on February 3rd stopped there. And I don't think I changed yeah. anything after that. So let's go on. And the yep. next part is reading this for the first time. Yeah, okay, yep. Um, abandonment, absence, and again, absence should be small a absent notice to the permit granting authority of a proposed date of decommissioning or written notice of extenuating circumstances. The large scale ground mounted solar voltaic installation shall be considered abandoned when it fails to operate for more than one year. Oh, this is very, this is exactly what we had before, right? Isn't it? 
It's a re. Mm -hmm. Is it the same as what we had before? No. Sounds okay. Like Sound, anyway, let's just go through this. And if it is the same as something we had before, I'll figure that out. Um, shall be considered abandoned when it fails to operate for more than one year without written consent of the permit granting authority. If the owner or operator of the solar energy system fails to remove the installation in accordance with the requirements of this section within 150 days of, of abandonment or the proposed date of decommissioning, the town retains the right after the receipt of an appropriate court order to enter and remove an abandoned hazardous or decommissioned large-scale ground-mounted solar energy system. As a condition of site plan approval or special permit, the applicant and landowner shall agree to allow entry to remove an abandoned or decommissioned installation. The town may use the financial surety as stipulated in financial surety section for this purpose. Mm -hmm. So this is new, yes. Okay, any issues about this section? Yeah, let's see. Martha, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so then do we want to say anything about what happens after the removal in terms of the restoration of the site? You know, like reforested or return the, the you know, the plantings or the way we, we said it the above session? I think we said that above, right? Didn't yeah, we said it above, but now it's falling on the town to, to do the removal. So I does, see. Okay. does the town also have to then charge this surety for replantings. Okay. So I need to come up with some language that matches what was up above. Yeah, I guess it would, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. There, I guess the town would have to work with the landowner in terms of what the next mm -hmm. use of the land is. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we should be putting a priority on if it was once forested, return it to forest, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I have to learn how to write faster. <laughs> um, okay, anything else about that paragraph? All right, well, let's go on to the next one then. Financial surety. Proponents of large-scale ground-mounted solar voltaic, photovoltaic installation projects shall provide a form of surety, either through cash, certified bank check, escrow amount, bond, or otherwise held by and for the town of Amherst to cover the cost of installation removal and stabilization of the site in the event that the town must remove the installation and remediate the landscape in an amount and form determined to be reasonable by the permit granting authority, but in no event to exceed more than 125% of the cost of removal and compliance with the additional requirements set forth herein, as determined by the project proponent. Such surety will not be required for town or state owned facilities. Any comments? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Martha. Yeah. Uh, so who is the project proponent? Project proponent would be the ah, well, that's a good question. Who is the project proponent? Okay. Normally that would be the applicant, but in this case we're talking about removal, so mm -hmm. I guess they shouldn't on their own come up with this 125% because they could under, under value that. Usually what we do um, now is we have the um, applicant give us an estimate of what he thinks it will cost to remove the, um, the equipment. And then we have our town engineer and mm -hmm. our building commissioner check those numbers. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but who is the proponent there? That's a good question. Is the proponent the town who's going to remove it, or is it the applicant who may have fled town by that point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they're making this yeah. claim when they propose the project, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's right. So, Sorry, so that just... would be the applicant then. 
Yes, I was just going to say it's the yes. applicant because you have further down here saying that it's the estimate shall be reviewed by the town. So it's definitely oh, okay. not the town. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, all right. So next paragraph, the project proponent shall submit a fully inclusive estimate of the costs associated with removal prepared by a qualified registered professional engineer. Such an estimate shall be reviewed by the town of Amherst and adjusted as needed to reflect the opinion of the town as to fair costs. <clears throat> the amount shall include a mechanism for prorating removal costs as costs may be affected by inflation and or changes to disposal regulations. So we do normally have an inflation um, mm -hmm. uh, component of this estimate um, and it's I believe over a 20 year period. Okay. Um, next paragraph, salvage for solar panels and or for other components of the installation may be included at the discretion of the permit granting authority. So in other words, you don't have to throw them away. You can try to reuse them somewhere or do something else with them. This surety will be due and payable at the issuance of the building permit. Proof of payment in the form of a receipt from the town treasurer will be shown to the building commissioner before permits are issued. The financial surety shall be maintained by the proponent for the lifespan of the facility. In other words, if the um, proponent has a bond, then he's required to keep up payments for that bond mm -hmm. with annual certification notices from the surety company or bank for surety bonds submitted to the PGA. We do have situations like that now where developers have built buildings and they were required to do something. And if they weren't able to do it, they had to give the town a bond and they are required to keep up um, the bond. Mm -hmm. um, as a condition of approval, an applicant shall bind itself to grant the necessary license or easement to the town to allow entry to remove the structures and stabilize the site. The town have, shall have the right, but not the obligation to remove the facility. Anything there? All right, yep, Janet. Muted. Chris, I wondered in the, the line that, um, the um, instead of saying, um, sending the, the surety bonds or the certification or the existence of them to the PGA, it should go to the planning department. Because I, I have a feeling we'll never make it its way to the ZBA or the planning board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Submitted to the planning department uh, or building commissioner. Building commissioner, yeah. Whoever's in charge. Yeah, building commissioner is the keeper of things like that. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, okay, moving along. Taxes or payment in lieu of taxes. If the project would otherwise be exempt from the payment of personal or real property taxes, the applicant shall enter into a tax agreement or a payment in lieu of taxes, otherwise known as a pilot agreement with the town of Amherst that provides an equivalent amount of tax revenue to the town as determined by the board of assessors. Any tax related agreement or pilot shall be approved by the Board of Assessors prior to the issuance of the building permit. Now, Stephanie may know more about this than I do, but um, I believe that in my knowledge of the town that any um, privately owned uh, large scale solar array would be taxed by the town normally. And I don't think that there would be um, the question of a pilot, but I don't, I'm not privy to all of these uh, agreements. Anybody have any questions about that? I just wanted to add a quick response to Chris's referencing me here. Yeah. Um, so we did actually, we have a pilot for the solar landfill project. Uh -huh. Because it's on public land and the town didn't, doesn't own that system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is a pilot in that case. Great. Okay. Thank you. I right, think. Thanks, Dan. Um, yep, Janet. Um, I, I, in addition to what Stephanie just said, it could be a solar array on college land institute or nonprofits land. 
And so we're not normally um, taxing nonprofits, but mm-hmm. so I would just, I think it's good to have this as a blanket. You know, there might be a way to say, yes, it's on nonprofit land, but if it's a private company, you know, operating a solar array, that's not within the purpose of the nonprofit. So it's taxable. Mm-hmm. I think this just gives you that extra layer of thing. The other thing I have is just, I feel like this is super petty. And um, I think we need to use very consistent language about, is it the applicant, the proponent, the owner? Mm-hmm. And we can just repeat that language. Because when I see a different word, I just start saying, oh, is this a different person? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that's like a comb through later, just to make sure there's consistency. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep, I have a uh, comment as well. I, I have seen other um, towns and, and, and jurisdictions and some national uh, material with regard to uh, in, above and beyond a pilot that towns can negotiate with a owner, particularly for these larger scale projects, uh, to support community a community benefit fund or mm-hmm. something along those lines. Um, and I, I don't think it would fit under a pilot because I think a pilot has to be based on sort of real values and so forth. Um, but uh, I am wondering whether this would be a place if we wanted to to insert a section that talks about that the town um, may, I, I don't think it's a it's a requirement at all, but that a town may negotiate um, or or um, work with the uh own, proponent owner <laughs> um uh on 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 establishing a community benefit fund uh to support um community benefits um uh from, from the project you know something along those lines mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay yeah 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 okay and right. Mar- martha no i just want to say i i really like that idea i mean i think that uh you know this this whole effort of putting so in ground mounted solar is at some you know cost to the town in terms of supervision or uh, you know various kinds of uses and so on and so I like the idea of having the option of negotiating some kind of of payment so good thought mm-hmm. okay appeals any person aggrieved by a decision of the planning board may appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals as provided under Mass General Law, Chapter 40A of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Any person aggrieved by a decision of the Zoning Board of Appeals may appeal to Superior Court. Any appeal of the decision of the Zoning Board of Appeals must be filed within 20 days of filing of the decision with the town clerk. So in other words, if you don't agree with a decision of the Planning Board, you do have recourse to appeal it to the Zoning Board of Appeals. But then if you don't agree with the zoning board you have to go to the court but uh, and there is a 20-day appeal period and that's kind of standard for all special permits um my my feeling is that we're going to want to require special permits for all of these installations there may be a case where we would rather have a site plan review but i feel these things are big enough and you know kind of new enough that going to the ZBA for a special permit is a better course, but we're not sure about that, about that yet. So that's why we have the planning board in here also. Okay, so that's the end of that section. All right. Great, yep, thank you, Chris. So that, um, um, I guess maybe we'll circle back as a second reading uh, just for those the final sections that were added uh, next time, mm-hmm. uh, but we can proceed into the first reading of the new new section that you put together. Okay, and the new section is um, what is the applicant required to submit when he submits his application to either the Zoning mm-hmm. Board of Appeals or the Planning Board. Um, so uh, it starts out with mentioning the fact that the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board both have their own requirements for submittals. So. Um, Submittal requirements. The applicant shall refer to the rules and regulations of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Section 3.1, Application Requirements for Applications to the Board, and the rules and regulations of the Planning Board, Article 2, Applications for Detailed Information about Submittal Requirements. And then, in addition to the requirements listed in the CBA and Planning Board rules and regulations, the applicant shall submit the following information. And there may be more things that we want to add to this. I haven't reviewed this with the building commissioner yet. 
but this is a pretty pretty comprehensive list. So Before first, we start that list, um, Bob, did you have a, a comment? Yeah, just a quick refresher. Through these, there's an automatic referral to the Conservation Commission? If there is a wetland on the site um, or a, a wetland um, buffer zone, uh, these things would be submitted to or referred to the Conservation Commission for we what we do is we send a transmittal to a whole list of town staff people um, and Erin Schock is one of them and then she can review the application and see whether uh, there is a need to bring it to the Conservation Commission but more often than not um, we would actually you know, walk over to Erin's desk and have a conversation with her or send her an email directly to her and say, hey, we think there's a wetland on this property. Um, could you help us to look at it and evaluate whether it needs to go to the Conservation Commission or not? So does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Should we go ahead? Yes, please. Okay. So number one, an existing conditions plan with property lines and physical features, including abutting land uses <clears throat> and location of structures within 300 feet of the site, topography and roads, characteristics of vegetation, mature trees, shrubs, open field, etc., and wetlands for the project site. This plan shall be prepared, stamped, and signed by a registered land surveyor licensed to practice in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Okay. Janet? Oh, sorry. I'm not the person who's in charge of... No, it's, that's okay. I was trying to get through a couple <laughs> in the list first, but go ahead, Janet. <laughs> so I was, I was looking at some other... Um, uh, draft by actual bylaws, and I, I wondered, and you might, this might show up later, but I thought we should put in slopes um, and then lot lines. Slopes and lot lines. Uh, property lines are lot lines. Okay. So and, and then slopes. Some, yep. some, another town had um, talked about wildlife corridors um, and sort of water recharge areas or something like that, too. So, and then in this one and the next one, just to, for consolidation, I, I wondered again about like bullets or just listing things out because I think that creates clarity in the applicant about like, oh, we need that instead of a long paragraph, although it becomes then longer. But I think yeah. just especially in number two, I got very lost. Yeah. Oh, slopes is in number two. Sorry. So right. there is something. Yes, I was going to say that slopes is in number two. Okay. So we already have that covered. Yeah. Wildlife corridors are usually covered by. Um, the maps that we have of endangered species, um, but not all wildlife wildlife covers the corridors would be shown on those maps. Um, so we'll see whether we can include that. I will consult Aaron. All right, and it's uh, Jack. Yes. Um, so yeah, slopes on the site. I don't think slopes off the site um, pertain. Although I, I I feel like a, a USGS topographic map usually is provided with these is that correct chris usually yes so you can get an idea of what yeah. the topography is beyond mm -hmm. the site itself yeah. and you, that, that that should be more than mm -hmm. information with regard to what's going on slope wise off the site mm -hmm. okay um proposed changes to the landscape of the site including grading vegetation vegetation clearing and planting, exterior lighting, including locations, type, and wattage, screening vegetation or structures, signs, locations, sign locations, service vehicle parking and access roads, and stormwater management systems. The square footage of each disturbed area shall be identified on a plan, and details of any site alteration, <clears throat> including number, sizes, and species of trees to be removed shall be provided. A calculation of slopes throughout the site as a percentage over consecutive 100 foot distances. This plan shall be prepared, and st prepared, stamped, and signed by a professional engineer licensed to practice in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So keep in mind that at the very end of this, there's a paragraph that says any of these things can be waived by mm -hmm. the permit granting authority um, so that, you know, for instance, a site that is 
say 30 or 40 acres in size, you probably wouldn't um, identify uh, as to size and species every tree that's on the site. Um, so that might be something that gets waived. It could be just sort of a general description of the types of vegetation that are there. Um, any questions about that one? Go ahead, Janet, if that's a new hand. Oh, no, sorry. OK. Mm -hmm. no, that was my bullet suggestions. Yep. OK, three, drawings of the solar voltaic installation signed by a professional engineer licensed to practice in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, showing the proposed layout of the system, <clears throat> any potential shading from nearby structures or vegetation, the distance between the system and all property lines, existing on-site buildings and structures, and the tallest finished height of the solar array. OK. Um, Dwayne? Yeah. I think yeah, we're just gonna, yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Janet. I think this might be a yellow line of just adding in, you know, drawings of the battery storage system, if there is one. So kind of just putting that in as a potential future thing. Yeah, I was going to similarly suggest in the layout of the system uh, to maybe be a little bit more explicit that we want to see where the arrays are, the rows of the arrays, the location of the battery energy storage system, if applicable, and the location of the inverter. Okay, uh, wait a minute. Can you list those again where the arrays are? What The, the, the layout of the uh, rows of the array. Layout of rows, yep. Um, the location of the um, energy storage system, if applicable. Yep. Location of the inverter. And, and I would also say locate, location uh, of, uh, of the interconnection um, poles and wires, I guess. Okay. Yeah, I think that that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. All right, and that's all number three. Okay. Um, number four, one or three, uh, three line electrical diagram detailing the solar photovoltaic installation, associated components and electrical interconnection methods <clears throat> with all national electrical code compliant disconnects and overcurrent devices. Again, I'm going to review this with the building commissioner mm -hmm. and probably with the electrical inspector. Mm -hmm. um, five, documentation and technical spec specifications of the major system components to be used, including photo photovoltaic panels, mounting system, inverters, and any storage batteries. Okay. Great. Janet? Well, I was thinking about service roads and fencing too. I'm assuming, yeah. So. Is that is that covered in the second paragraph? Service vehicle parking and access roads. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that includes fencing, though, does it? Yeah, right. Okay. I would put fencing more up in that in that paragraph, though. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, number six. Did we? We're on number six, right? Yep. Proposed wattage of the solar fo photovoltaic installation solar power generation indicated in both direct current DC and alternating current AC. A notation shall be included explaining the difference e.g. loss in conversion from DC to AC. I'm sure that's something Laura knows a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, number seven, locations and details of all security measures for the site. That would include fencing. Mm -hmm. um, eight, name, address, and contact information for the proposed system installer. Nine, name, address, phone number, and signature of the project proponent. And I guess we want to have the word, or maybe I'll just put slash applicant. 
as well as all co-proponents or property owners, if any. Uh, the name, contact information, and signature of any age agents representing the project proponent or applicant. Number 11, documentation of actual or prospective access and control of the project site sufficient to allow for construction and operation of the proposed solar photovoltaic installation. And sometimes that takes the form of a lease or a, um, a transfer, a deed or something mm -hmm. of that nature. Um, 12, a plan for the operation and maintenance of the solar photovoltaic installation. That's common in Zoning Board of Appeals applications where we have an operations and maintenance plan. Um, 13, the zoning district designation for the parcels of land comprising the project site. 14, a utility connection plan and an acknowledgement of application from the electric utility. 15, a list identifying all offsite electrical system improvements necessary to the electric grid to accommodate the power from the proposed installation and identification of what entity is paying for such improvements. Okay. Number 16, proof of liability insurance. The owner or operator of the large scale <clears throat> ground mounted solar photovoltaic installation shall provide the, the model that I was looking at said provide it to the town clerk, but I think in our case, we would provide it to the building commissioner with a certificate of insurance showing that the property has sufficient liability coverage pursuant to industry standards. Usually we do provide those things to the building commissioner. Um, 17, a public outreach plan, including, I thought this was interesting. Um, a public outreach plan, including a project development timeline which indicates how the project proponent applicant will inform of Butters and the community. The town of Amherst will publish a legal notice in the local paper, notify Butters within 300 feet of the proposed project by mail and post the public hearing in accordance with chapter 40A section 11. So I'm just saying that this is what the town of Amherst will do, but the first part of this is requiring that the applicant actually notify abutters and and um, make the project known to the uh, community. Great, let's pause there for Janet. Mm -hmm. I, I love that idea. Um, I forgot, I, I meant to, I raised a while. On number 12, the plan for operations and maintenance of the photo, solar photo um, voltaic installation I thought we could yellow line again, battery storage and annual training an emergency plan and annual training of emergency responders. I think that, that seems like a logical spot for that. Battery storage and annual training. Of um, what is the word for firefighters? <laughs> emergency responders, yeah. Yeah, because I, I was thinking, you know, we can just highlight that in yellow because I think um, that will come up probably later mm -hmm. with battery storage regs. So. Yeah. Um, description of financial security. In other words, we want them to tell us what they're proposing to submit to the town. Uh, 19, pre-construction photos from the right of way and nearest to butters. These photos should include tree coverage. Number 20, a visualization, a rendering or photo simulation of post-construction solar development, including perspectives from right of right right of ways, I think that's supposed to be rights of way, but whatever, um, nearest abutting properties or residential structures and tree coverage. The planning board or zoning board of appeals may determine additional visualizations and or visual impact analysis to be submitted for review in cases where the planning board, the zoning board of appeals or town staff determine that the project is likely to be visible from significant areas or roadways. That's something that we also require for um, those monopoles for, um, mm -hmm. what do we call it? Wire wireless telecommunication mm -hmm. devices. Uh, 21, a glare analysis and proposed mitigation, if any, to minimize the impact on affected properties and roads. All right, let's take a pause for uh, Janet again. I, I was looking at some other um, bylaws and 
Um, some of them have a lot of stuff about visual impacts, like a you know visual impact analysis and a glare analysis and offsets and things like that. And and so, I just maybe we could yellow line that, um, you know, because that could emerge from our community meetings as a big issue. Mm -hmm. There's language that you know makes that, you know, like I could you know pull out language that talks about that more detailed. Um, and then in terms of mitigation, like. I think we should just have a mitigation, you know, mitigation plan for dot 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 because like it depends on what you're mitigating or offsetting. It could be loss of soils, carbon loss of carbon sequestration, farmland, it could, you know, I mean it could be it depends on what you care about or what you're, you know, worried about. And so I thought we just put that as a yellow line because I saw some um, you know, like I'm trying to think Belchertown, there's different um towns are kind of regulating different aspects and looking to mitigate different things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that comes out of the um, meeting with the Zoning Board of Appeals, or if in the case that it would be the Planning Board, um, that they would require that. But um, so in other words, I guess what I'm saying is we're not sure. We could guess about what what those boards would like to see mitigation plans for, but we may not know yeah the and then, things and then there's like offsets versus mitigation so i thought mm -hmm. it's kind of like maybe just leave that as a yellow blob mm -hmm. um for further thought mm -hmm. okay um okay number 23 location and approximate height and percent tree cover on the site at the time of application filing Again, this is something that I am not sure for a very large site whether this actually is realistic, but we have it in here for now. Um, trees with a di di diameter at breast height of 18 inches for evergreen trees and 12 inches for deciduous trees or greater within the project parcel shall be identified to determine tree loss along with inventorying of disease or hazard trees slated to be removed due to the proposed development. Um, okay. Well, you you did skip twenty two, but I think that's oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Documentation by an acoustic engineer of noise levels projected to be generated by both the installation and operation of the facilities. My understanding is that the panels themselves don't make noise, but sometimes the battery storage facility does. The inverter, actually, the inverter, I'm not sure about the battery inverter. storage, but the inverter can have a hum. Um, I mean, that's another area where there can be mitigation um, plans uh, in terms of shrubbery or something to mitigate that noise. Okay. Um, document number, number 24, documentation of all soil types as identified on the United States Natural Resources Conservation Service Soil Survey on all land involved with the project. 25, locations of natural and cultural resources based on reviews of publicly available data or consultation with town staff <clears throat> and state agencies. Such locations to include active farm and prime farmland soils, floodplains, wetlands and vernal pools, wellhead protection areas, permanently protected open space, natural heritage and endangered species program, estimated and priority habitats, biomap two, critical natural landscape and core habitat. Um, locations of inventoried historic buildings, local or national registered district, historic district and scenic roads or byways and archaeologically sensitive areas. These locations can be identified using the Amherst GIS Viewer, Mass GIS 25, Massachusetts Historical Commission's Massachusetts Cultural His Resources Information System, which is called MACRIS, and through filing a project notification form with the um, Mass Historical Commission, reviewing the local and reviewing local plans such as the Amherst Master Plan, Amherst Open Space Plan and Recreation Plan, and through consultation with town staff, the Planning Board or Zoning Board of Appeals at its discretion may require these locations to be described on a map 
or in a narrative, depending on the sensitivity of the resources identified. Sometimes um, those resources are not allowed to be um, talked about in public because they're sensitive and mm. these various state entities are concerned about um, people going in and pilfering them. But in any event, those those are important things, especially for large scale solar arrays that may be in areas that haven't been really, you know, it's one thing if it's on an agricultural field, but if it's in a forest, it seems that this would be an important um, bit of information. Okay, um, 26 stormwater management and erosion and sedimentation control plans. That's kind of a standard thing that we require and we usually get a, a report about that. 27, a complete list of chemicals, fuels, and any other hazardous materials to be used in both the construction and operation phase. Mm -hmm. 28, a calculation of earthwork operations, listing the amount of soil and or rock to be imported or exported from the site. If any material is to be imported, such material shall be clean and without contamination by hazardous substance, substances or invasive species and must be in, obtained from, a, from sources approved by the Amherst Department of Public Works. Number 29, provision of water, including that needed for fire protection. And then the last note here is, upon the applicant's written request submitted as part of the application, the Planning Board or Zoning Board of Appeals may waive any documenta documentary requirements as it deems appropriate. So, Okay. Right. That's yeah, great, <laughs> a great, a great list. A pretty um, good list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Janet, and, and then I had one comment as well. Um, jumping back to um, oh god, I lost it now. Oh, um, number twenty-five, the locations of natural and cultural resources. Yeah, I wondered if you could use like some language um, broader than um, well-held protection areas, like water recharge areas just you know watershed recharge areas or kind of a broader thing than wellhead protection just just so we know what's going on is there a definition of that water recharge area i mean i, think, I feel like i i feel like i'm missing the term somehow jack help me yep jacks yeah so um can we scroll back up to where you're I think she's talking about number 25, the first oh, 25. Okay. Water recharge. Yeah. The first subparagraph. Uh is that right? Wellhead protection. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So so basically, you know, every every area is a recharge area within the town, except for the discharge areas, which generally are wetlands. Uh, in the area bordering, you know, uh, riverways and things like that. So I don't think we're going to go too broad with the word uh, recharge. And, and I guess the, 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 we do have surface water protection areas, uh, Atkins Reservoir, namely. Um, and that's the one I think we would want to uh, qualify, that recharge area. Because that's... That's already mapped as part of the watershed uh, protection area. It's mapped yeah, on the zoning map. We don't say that though. Like, I guess watershed recharge area. I feel like I'm missing something in terms of this term, but I could just maybe put it in yellow and. Well, high protection area or, or uh, designated uh, surface water protection area, surface water supply protection area. Because the whole town is a recharge area for un, for groundwater. Correct. So we can't use just general recharge. Right. All right. Great. My my um, are you, is that done, Jenna and and Jack? Do you have another comment? I'm actually a little unclear on the phrase because I was waiting for Chris to type it in, but maybe I'm she's just taking. Oh. Out. Um, I think Stephanie is doing the typing. We'll see it um, next time. But we could yeah. highlight the wellhead protection areas in yellow and elaborate on that if that's yeah. what you're 
interested I, in. Yeah, I think he said surface water protection supply. Surface think... water protection supply. That's what Jack okay. said. I wrote it down. Okay. Um, my my um, comment, I'm not sure if it's applicable here or maybe it's in a different section if I sort of have my head around this correct, but this is basically submittals upon application. Um, and I'm just wondering whether, and maybe it, it should appear somewhere else, but uh, is there uh, sort of some note at the bottom that's, that states that to the extent that any of these, any of the information in the, in these submittals change substantively over the course of the project development, um, that these, this information should be re resubmitted? I mean, because you know, I, I, and Laura could opine on this, but I, my my sense is that when a developer is developing uh, and, and uh, uh, proposing a solar project, it's subject to some change in terms of that layout of exactly where the rows might be, where they end up putting the storage, where they end up um, interconnection points, and so forth. Are subject can be subject to change, um, and just that the applicant should be on notification that they need to. Um, update the town on these submissions if anything substantively changes yes and that is actually part of the process okay when um but it's there's no harm in putting it in here yeah, but the okay. planning board or zoning board of appeals would ask the applicant or require the applicant to submit an updated plan based on you know the conversation that they've already had please show us an updated plan of x and then we were and the board is essentially saying to the applicant, we're not going to, you know, um, grant you your permit until you show us on a plan this change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, Martha. Yes. So uh, to, to the chair from your vice chair here, I'm just watching the time and thinking that we need to wrap it up and go on to discuss the ECAF letter yep. for a little bit and yeah, yep. we're getting we're getting we're really close because we just finished yeah. really okay. the review. So just any lingering questions, comments. Janet, is that a new hand? I, I can't keep track. Cool. OK, Martha, is that a new hand or is that the lingering too? OK, yep. I'm not. OK, great. OK, uh, any last words from you, Chris, on, on this? Uh, um, just my great appreciation for this really hard work and, and great um, drafting of this section. Thank you. I'm going to have to leave before um, 1.30, but yeah. Stephanie can fill me in on any, uh, any things that come up in the meantime. Great. All right, good. So, um, uh, so uh, next time on the agenda, obviously, we'll have the um, uh, solar resource uh, mapping uh, presented to us. But then in addition, we'll we'll have a second re reading of this section. And uh, and and to the extent that um, Chris has any uh, new new uh, drafting for us, we'll go through a first reading of that. OK, but. Let's move on to then the next agenda item, which is um, a letter that we received from ECAC, the Energy Climate Action Committee, um, that was in our packet today. And um, I, 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 I will present this being a, a member of, of ECAC uh, and, uh, and and so leading up their um, solar work as well. Um, and um, uh, and what what ECAC um, the, the and let, let me uh, share it on my screen so I can uh, talk about it. Um, yep. Great. Uh, so the purpose here um, for ECAC was not to uh, offer any strict um, recommendation or, or um, uh, uh, a, a, a opinion, but to help inform um, not only the uh, this zoning working uh, zoning bylaw working group, uh, but also uh, other constituents within the town um, with regard to um, trying to put in context, uh, if we think about ground mounted solar in Amherst, uh, helping to uh, put it in context in terms of the scaling that we may be talking about. 
uh, in Amherst. Obviously, we can't predict the future and we're not prescribing uh, specific targets here, but we just thought it would be helpful coming from ECAC uh, to illuminate and uh, uh, support the conversation uh, around siting, ground-mounted uh, solar siting in, in, in the town, uh, what we might be talking about uh, in terms of uh, scale and scope. And uh, so we went, as a committee, uh, we went through um, an analysis that was basically looking at um, one way that one might get their head around this question, admittedly not the only way, uh, and others may choose other ways, uh, and we're not suggesting it's the, the best and only way, uh, but one way to, to put her, your head, head around this in terms of what we might be talking about in terms of uh, um, ground-mounted, particularly solar in, Mass in, in Amherst, and the methodology we used was basically looking at what we do know uh, which is what the state and the common the Commonwealth has put forward in their 2050 decarbonization roadmap with regard to their expectations and anticipations with regard to how much um, to meet the goals uh, uh, and the requirements of the uh, of decarbonization by 2050 um, through what I would say is pretty sophisticated and 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 detailed uh, analysis and projections. Um, what they are expecting with regard to uh, de the decarbonization for the Commonwealth, the electricity system, 100% essentially renewable, um, and how much they are anticipating that would require specifically for a ground-mounted solar uh, across the Commonwealth. And this was explicitly um, uh, analyzed and evaluated and presented in the 2050 decarbonization roadmap. Uh, and so what we did from ECAC would say was say, OK, well, if we um, are a member of the Commonwealth uh, and we are uh, we represent some proportion uh, of land area in the Commonwealth, uh, to be precise, it's 0.29 percent uh, of the land area of the Commonwealth uh, for the town of Amherst, excluding the camp, the university and two college campuses. Uh, and we look at what the Commonwealth as a whole is looking for and, and, and expecting with regard to needing land area uh, for ground mounted solar arrays above and beyond reasonable um, expectations uh, and um, support for um, um, uh, a building mounted uh, or a built environment um, mounted solar uh, development. Uh, how much? How much is is sort of what we what we sort of refer to as our fair share, if you will, uh, uh, for for the town of Amherst to take on if we were to take on our fair share by land area uh, for the Commonwealth. And so, what we did was to go through analysis, recognizing that um, there's no single number that the uh, decarbonization roadmap provides for the Commonwealth, but it's a range. Uh, and it's arranged because they look at various different scenarios by which the Commonwealth as a whole can reach decarbonization by 2050, depending on, on, uh, uh, on projections of the future, which are uncertain. Uh, and uh, But they have a base case, which is their all options scenario. Uh, and even within each scenario, there's a range of uh, 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 expectations for land use for ground mounted solar uh, because of uncertainty and, and uh, uh, uncertainty bandwidths around different assumptions. Uh, but if we try to get use, use this uh, uh, statewide assessment to get a handle around what we're talking about in Amherst, uh, um, we can see that in the for the Commonwealth as a whole, um, they're, uh, they're expecting uh, under the different scenarios, uh, anywhere from 35,000 acres of land to 100, 125,000 acres of land uh, for the uh, to be needed for ground-mounted solar. Uh, this is across um, all sorts of land, not just forests, forests, farms, brownfields, landfields, land, landfills, and so forth. Uh, we made the assumption, we tried to narrow that down and take a, a good solid median range of that, for, of um, uh, uh, looking at if, if the Commonwealth needed 50 to 100 uh, acres of land for solar, what would be Amherst's fair share of that? Well, 
uh, based on our 2.29% of land area in Massachusetts, um, that would suggest that for, uh, for the town of Amherst, uh, we would be um, our fair share of land use for ground mounted solar would then turn out to be um, 145 to 290 acres of land. Um, this represents one to 2% of the town of Amherst land area. Um, so we're not talking about large proportions of Amherst land, uh, but nonetheless, one to 2% is um, noticeable for sure. Uh, and to give some um, context to that as well, um, that acreage of land, 145 to 290 acres, would represent the installed capacity DC uh, of about 36 to 72 megawatts of solar. Um, that's assuming four acres per megawatt, which is about what we would expect and is actually the case at Hickory Ridge, for example. Um, now keep in mind, so that's 36 to 72 megawatts of, of solar. Um, uh, do keep in mind that that's inclusive of what we already do have in Amherst, uh, which is roughly uh, or almost precisely 20 megawatts uh, installed, ground mounted, not not total, but ground mounted uh, solar arrays in Amherst is about 20 megawatts, uh, after, including Hickory Ridge, which is not constructed yet. Um, and so a recommendation for from ECAC uh, is that we keep this in mind. Uh, we're not specifying what we should, what the town should do, but, uh, but that uh, we should keep this in mind when establishing the zoning bylaws, uh, that um, we should be um, obviously taking into account other restrictions and constraints with regard to where solar should go, with regard to wetlands and um, uh, uh, setbacks, uh, public water supplies, slopes, and so forth, that we do keep in mind that, you know, having um, ability to site um, solar uh, in roughly, you know, 145 to 290 acres, uh, uh, 65 to 210 acres beyond what we already have, is sort of in the in the uh, target area that uh, at least ECAC would be uh, hoping to be able to see uh, with regard to um, offering uh, land area to meet um, our fair share, if you will, at least looking at it from that perspective, uh, to serve the needs of not only the town, but of the Commonwealth. Uh, obviously, to site uh, 65 to 210 acres of solar doesn't mean we have to zone just for that amount. Um, uh, because not every acre that is uh, zoned for solar at all is going to um, uh, host solar, uh, but that we should keep these uh, numbers in in mind um, as we start looking at our zoning uh, our zoning bylaw. Uh, we'll be looking at the um, GIS mapping of the solar resource assessment um, soon as well. Uh, but the idea is that the the hope from ECAC is basically that this analysis would help to provide some context uh, and scaling uh, with regard to what we're what we may be looking at for ground mounted solar in Amherst. Uh, so with that, let me um, ask if there's any questions or comments um, on that. Great. Yep, Martha. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, well, so, well, thank you, Dwayne. And I had attended the ECAC meeting when Dwayne gave his presentation and the ECAC then took about an hour to discuss back and forth what is our quote fair share, and um, yeah, that that went on. And you know, the using land area is one possibility, and so on. And uh, but we have to keep in mind what that what the uh, decarbonization roadmap did and the subsequent goals is they're using their best analysis, but it's projections, it's assumptions, what are the um, uh, so this is all based kind of on, you know, projections. You're, you're, you're um, breaking up a little bit, Martha, maybe slow down a little bit. Okay, uh, but really the, main uh, objection that I have is that this ignores the equally urgent need for CO2 sequestration. I mean, and that's clear in the 
state decarbonization roadmap where they talk about their four pillars and they say that by 2050 we're going to have hopefully the target is an 85 percent reduction in uh, fossil fuel and and co2 emissions and that remaining 15 percent has to be taken up with co2 sequestration and so that is an equally urgent need an equally urgent use for our forested land and, and lands here in the amherst area there's been a recent paper that was prepared for the IPCC by an international panel of climate scientists, which stated, you know, pretty bluntly, really, that if we do not increase our CO2 sequestration significantly, we're not even going to reach the goal of, of two degrees climate warning, warming, let alone uh, one and a half degrees. And so we need to keep in mind the balance. I mean, the challenge for Amherst really is to balance. Yes, we we need some ground mounted solar, but it's equally important that we do, quote, our fair share in terms of the uh, carbon sequestration. And I feel that this memo really is, you know, emphasizing only one side of the equation and it really needs to uh, be more balanced than that if it's going to be presented to our town you know not everybody on our town council or town staff you know is going to dive in and read the uh the 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 state's uh roadmaps and their and their goals and so on so um it's fine to consider the ecac's number as kind of an order of magnitude which i i think Dwayne, you know that's sort of the way you mean it but I'm really troubled that this is putting down, being put down as a literal number and we're not balancing it because it's really hard to look at an acre of land and say, oh, it's going to uh, you know, contribute X amount to sequestration in order to balance it off. But we've got to, we've got to consider both and, and try to get a good balance when we yeah, try to yeah. do this by yeah. well, I'm concerned that this is just the one side and and nothing is being written about the other side. <laughs> I think there's definitely room for um, yeah. uh, talking about um, more uh, opportunities for um, more forest protection in, yes. in, in around yeah. that, like the decarbonization roadmap. There's a significant portion uh, and attention given to the importance to protect uh, uh, forest land for its sequestration values and everything. This it's not suggesting that all forest land uh, needs needs to do that, but we need to up the amount of forest land that we have in sequestration. So I don't think it's one or the other. Uh, I would also exactly. point out, at least in the literature review that I've been doing, that at least on the looking at it only strictly, uh, and we shouldn't look at it this way. But if you look at it strictly from a carbon balance. Um, you're better off uh, with the with the solar um, uh, uh, um, collection displacing marginal energy energy uh, energy generation we can get into that um i think it's another topic uh, but it's not to suggest that um there isn't it just it's not in our zoning bylaw purview to um uh or or uh, to to um uh, it, it, to to talk about um opportunities for car for um uh, putting forest in protections and so forth that's a different different topic uh and the and the the commonwealth as a as 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 a whole is obviously not suggesting uh that we don't need ground mounted solar array we need both uh yeah. as the signs around town say we need both uh and i think the suggestion is uh that um uh we do need some for solar uh and this acreage is not necessarily need to be all in forest at all uh, but that there does need to be balance. I would agree with that. Uh, let me go to Jack and then Janet, and then let's close out just because we're at the end of time and I want the um, public comment uh, uh, to have some time. Yeah, I guess um, but I was <laughs> I was just going to speak to the, uh, that topic, but it, it kind of is, is, it's not pertaining to your memo directly. So I, I guess I will just kind of back up any comments right now. Uh, I, I was just going to mention that the amount of natural resources kind of set aside within the town of Amherst is, is uh, significant you know, on an acreage 
basis compared to other towns uh, in Western Mass, mainly well, Pioneer Valley. Um, and so, you know, big picture stuff, I think with regard to sequ uh, sequestration, Amherst, you know, is doing a pretty good job uh, in, you know, from the fair share argument. That's all I want to say. But, and then again, uh, yeah. we're, we're, we're in arrears with regard to tax revenue generating property as well. <laughs> and that's, that's another matter, not related. So, well, we're the ECAC is really diving in and trying to work on, you know, quite a few different aspects of the, you know, the climate mitigation and so on. But, the, but the one that they haven't really devoted any time to is the, uh, you know, the the lands for sequestration, and so that's what kind of started my. Uh, you know. well, I understand. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Janet, last comment. Um, so I, I understand that you have, again, Steve, you've had this real passion for this issue and the idea of fair share. I would love to stop talking about that and using that term because, you know, when I see the state 2020 climate plan, when I look at our Amherst's climate action plan, which the EAC did, is the state is not asking towns to produce a percentage of solar based on their land area. Um, and it's, there's nothing about the fair share that every town has to do a certain percentage. I mean, the state isn't saying, you know, they want to set aside 40% or 60% of the land for, you know, wild lands and natural lands. They're not going to ask Cambridge to do that. They have Danahee Park, you know, and so I think we should, you know, this is a regional problem. This is a national problem. You know, in the state climate plan, the goal is to increase the amount of forest and farmland and wetlands um, and increase you know, the, the production, the, the protection of those, not to pit solar against natural lands. Um, no other town is doing this kind of analysis. And we don't even know the results of the D, DOER solar assessments. Like, you know, you know, we saw that survey, we could meet the solar need by highways and brownfields and parking lots and rooftops. I mean, they had all those percentages and we have no guidance from the state about where they wanna emphasize and what their priority is. When I looked at the climate action plan, it doesn't even suggest this idea of a percentage of solar. It, 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 it talks about where it could go. And there's a lot of conversation about farmland and protecting farmland, encouraging farmers to do more regenerative practices, seeing local food production as not only you know, part of climate action goals, but also kind of um, a social justice goal to have more food access to local food for um, low income communities. Um, you know, I just don't, I just kind of am lost at this analysis because I don't see anybody else doing it. Um, it's, it's just, you know, some towns are going to pre present a lot of wildlands, natural lands, forest lands, the Connecticut River Valley towns, which are largely the poorest towns, you know, remarkably in Massachusetts, or they have amazing soils. And so we're going to provide the farmlands, you know, for the Commonwealth. And so I, I don't, I just am lost on this percentage analysis and I, I appreciate the data-driven approach, but it doesn't seem to reflect the reality of how the state and even our town is proceeding on the climate mitigation. And um, I just, I'm just, I, I just, I don't understand it basically. I just think we should set aside the idea of fair share. We should figure out where we'd want solar to go. We should recognize that Amherst has been kind of brilliant in setting aside farmland and forest land. And, you know, Lord knows we have a lot of wetland and that's sequestering like 10 times the amount of carbon of anything else. And so I don't think the state or the Amherst climate action plans are asking towns to give up their farmland, give up their forest lands. I think it's kind of, we need to take a more regional and holistic approach saying, you know, I mean, if you start doing this analysis, we're gonna start covering the poorest towns in Massachusetts with solar while the richest towns won't. And so I, I think we need to wait for state guidance and just look at what we have in our own action plans, the state plans and implement them. All right, appreciate that. Uh, again, it wasn't meant to be uh, prescriptive or, or uh, suggestive that the, the, these are precise targets. Uh, it's meant to be, um, while there has been a, a, a dearth of, of um, 
attention given or or analysis to what we what we what range of order of magnitude as was mentioned that we might be talking about in terms of uh, expectations of uh, whether you call it fair share or just if on average across the Commonwealth uh, this this uh, need for ground mounted array was evenly distributed this is what it this is what we would be talking about I think it helps to give um, our committee our working group ECAC and others uh, some something one number at least and I'm encourage uh, other people to to do their own analysis uh, on this as well uh, but it's meant to uh, give some grounding and some scoping and scaling of um, of um, uh, of this issue uh, that the, the the Commonwealth as a whole and every town is going to be working um, working um, working on uh, so that was the purpose of it um, let me um, Ask Stephanie to see if there's any public comments and we'll go over just a, a couple more minutes. Um, yes, there is. Steve Roof has his hand up and I will unmute him. Steve, go ahead, you can talk. Great, thank you. Um, Steve Roof from South Amherst, a uh, member of the ECAC, I've worked with Duane a lot on this issue and I'm expressing my own opinions here on this particular topic. Um, Remember, where Massachusetts is emitting about 70 million tons of CO2 in the atmosphere every year. Forests might be able to suck about 5 million tons of that out. So they're not equal shares. And if we don't stop burning fossil fuels, all the forests in the United States wouldn't be enough to balance our carbon emissions. So we really must focus on stop stopping the burning of fossil fuels. Um, and a good reason for doing that is that the fossil fuels are, that provide our electricity are currently burned in power plants in some of the poorest communities of the state where they have astronomical asthma rates and shortened lifespans and high, high medical costs associated with that. So I would be personally really embarrassed if Amherst said no solar in our town and yet we keep getting our electricity from fossil fuel power plants down in um, in other towns, uh, poorer, poorer towns. So I think we really do need to step up, think about our share and say, yeah, we can do this. We're willing to contribute the solar. That's what we did in Hampshire. We said, yes, we will put it in our backyard because we feel that that's our contribution. Um, that said, I, you know, when I, we, we talked about this at our last meeting, we can preserve, the goal is to preserve something like 40% um, of land for natural and working lands and preserve that from development. And we're talking only one to 2% for solar. So I do not see these as in conflict, not at all. I think we can easily accommodate both. Yeah. The thing we have to watch out for is other kinds of development. It's houses, rural sprawl, um, urban sprawl, houses, roads, businesses, those are the things that are eating up the forest. So we, we maybe need to pay more attention to, to concerns about that kind of development than solar development. Yeah. And then finally, Martha, you mentioned that it's sort of all based on projections. That's true, but remember uncertainty in those projections can cut both ways. And yes, if, yes. if we don't get power from Quebec, like the plan has imagined, then we're gonna need more, uh, more solar power and more wind power. If wind power doesn't develop as fast offshore, then we will need more wind. So right now these are estimates for sure, but the uncertainty cuts both ways. We may need more than what's in that plan right now. But I think what we can do is work together to come up with a plan. Let's come up with a plan where we preserve 40 or 50% of Amherst um, to maintain its, its sequestration and while identifying that 2% or so of land that can be used for solar. That's a great goal we should all work together for. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Steve. Yes. Thanks. And and really it's it's about the balance. It it's got to be both. Yep. And appreciate Steve yeah. articulating that um yes. better than better yes. than I, I was able yes. to. Yes, yeah. And and okay. I have a personal thanks to Steve. I got a great tour of the uh Hampshire uh college uh solar a, a week or so ago and, and learned quite a lot. So okay, great. Um Let's go, uh, Stephanie, I think there's one more public comment and then I think we'll need to close out. Okay, Lenore, I'm unmuting you. You can go ahead and speak. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for all your hard work. 
I, I don't get to attend the whole meeting, so you'll always have to excuse me if, if my knowledge gaps show here. Um, oh, yeah, yeah let some... me call you back in a few minutes. I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Lenore. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I don't want to talk about this too much now, but I think this requires more conference table talking. Um, I totally agree with Steve about we need to be careful of other development. Um, that's taking our land and we need to stop burning fossil fuels um, and we need to come together to see what we can do here. Um, I also totally agree with everything that Janet and Martha, you know, said. I, I, we, we do need to not be in conflict, but there is some conflict that I actually think the state has set us up for because the state itself is evolving in its understanding of the climate. Right now, there's a bunch of legislation that will probably impact our solar bylaws, and we need to be aware of that. Um, the state doesn't necessar isn't necessarily this all-knowing king that understands everything that needs to happen here, um, because there is a lot of ignorance in, in what even created the, the climate um, collapse, and this idea of fair share and what's our contribution is a whole topic in and of itself. You know, if, if I'm having a dinner party and I have squash to contribute and my, you know, my neighbor has turnips to contribute to the soup or what, it's like we bring what we have to contribute. What Amherst has to contribute is our land. That is, that is such a valuable contribution. And it's not anything, it's not less than um, solar arrays. And of course we're going to have solar, of course we're going to do that. That's not the, that's not the question. The question is um, these kinds of carbon metrics are inherently flawed because some of the calculations, first of all, are taken from working forests, which is mostly what we have. We don't really even have real forests anymore. Um, and so we don't really understand completely what the, capacity of carbon sequestration is, or what the value of biodiversity is, or what the value of soil health is, because none of that has been studied yet in its entirety, in a, in a holistic perspective. It's just little bits and pieces. And so our, our data is flawed and our analysis is flawed to begin with. And I'm encouraging us not to solve this whole problem, but that we need to think outside the box a little bit more and not just take like, okay, this is what the state says. Okay, this is what's fair share. Okay, this is how much land we have. Okay, because that's not going to give us all the information we need to really make the best choices. I'm gonna leave that at that. I have a question. Um, this template that you were using, I don't really know where it's from um, for the for the bylaw. And, and I do appreciate Chris, all, all that incredible detail. I'm hoping that you're including Shootsbury's new amended version because this is their second go around and they are geographically our closest neighbor. And it's a wonderful template to use. And I hope that you're gonna, gonna take advantage of all of that work that was already done. Um, uh, and here's three more, can I ask three more questions? Quick? Quickly. Quick. Um, has your process been informed by what's gone wrong in the state, because that's also important to include in drafting your, your bylaws, because um, they had bylaws too. And for instance, what happened in Williamsburg, which by the way, is the same company that we're using it for Hickory Ridge. Um, that's a, another question. The other question I, I have is, are you realizing when you talk about restoration of a site that you can't replant forest land. That's not possible. If it took 25, 50 years to get there, and then after 25 years of solar rays, and then you're gonna wait another 50 years, that's not, there's a myth in reforestation as opposed to the um, value of proforestation, which is keeping what you have and restoring that and building on that. Um, and the last thing I wanna, um, say besides the state legislation, besides keep an eye on what's happening with state legislation is that um, I think it would really be valuable to have a presentation by uh, climate scientists that are science experts in 
terrestrial mitigation, soil health, forest ecology to help kind of understand this piece of it a little bit more as we uh, create a robust solar bylaw. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Stephanie, you want to um, uh, comment and then maybe we'll close out? I'll make it very quick. I just wanted to let Lenore uh, respond to Lenore's inquiry about um, Chris's drafting. It She looked at 12 different bylaws. Shootsbury was one of them, but it's not based on any one specific community because Amherst, while it's our closest neighbor, is still different from Shootsbury. And so some of our um, needs are different than than Shootsbury's. So she did she did look at all of them and sort of weighed that all in, in putting her draft together. Yeah, totally understand. I wanted to make sure it was the amended version that she looked at, which <clears throat> is a brand new version. I yeah. believe so. Yeah, thank you. Okay, with that, um, we will leave uh, the future topic for discussion that Janet wanted to bring forward, and I had some thoughts on that as well, uh, till next time as well, if we can fit it in. Um, and um, uh, I'd like to um, close the meeting then. Dwayne, could we start with that topic? Because it it should be short. Um, we have the mapping uh to go through uh, we'll probably start with that uh since it's an outside speaker uh and then um uh we'll see how long that takes i i obviously do want to spend some time on the on the on the language uh again for the bulk of our meetings but yes we'll try to fit that in janet i'll send a memo out and then um if stephanie posts it to the um our resources section i think that takes care of um our, so that at least get the ideas out and then um, we could talk about it at the end. Okay, Jack, real quickly. Yeah, um, pardon it. Um, if we discuss what is the what is the topic? What is uh, uh, Janet's? <laughs> it's a topic about topics. <laughs> I was hoping that we do some um, meetings, like an hour each, maybe on um, forest lands and agricultural lands, and um, in in the Pioneer Valley. So, so informational. Okay. Yeah, I just want to understand how it um, is going to be very helpful to us in the writing of the of the bylaws, but we can get to that next time. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, for your time, and um, we'll see you um, in two weeks. Okay. Very good. Thank okay. you. Thank you.